Okay, hey everyone. This section has lots of details in it. Algebra, trig, uh, lots of stuff going on. And so I'm not going to try to uh, go through all that material. It's in the text or else you're responsible for it. Instead, I want to make sure that you get the main principles behind this section that I do talk about in the text, but I just want to emphasize them together, okay? So here's the idea. We are studying uh, mass, uh, spring, friction, and then we're going to throw on forcing uh, later on as well. So it'll be a non-homogeneous once we have the forcing, but for now it's going to be like this. So we can, kind of, we can think of this as a mass, which this is the rusting place. You've got the wall there, you've got the spring, you've got the mass, and then we're going to pull that mass uh, out a ways. And once we have it out here, we're going to give it a push. Well, we could just let it go, but we're allowed to give it a push. We could either push it towards the, towards the resting place, which is here at zero, or we could push it this way further, right? Of course, we could also start it in and give it a push either way. So we have lots of options. But the idea is once we, once we pull it out and give it, and then give it a push either towards the center the equilibrium space or away from the equilibrium so that it's going to head this way and then get pulled back by the spring, what's going to be the motion of this block, okay? And I, I want you to, to think of it carefully before we look at the mathematics because hopefully the mathematics will verify uh, and substantiate and quantify what your, what your intuition tells you, okay? So first of all, let, let's actually uh, look at this equation. If you look at it and say, okay, how do we solve that? Well, we know how to solve it now. We first get the characteristic equation. There's the characteristic equation. And then we need to, to solve this, right? We need to find the values of lambda that make that zero. And since it's nothing that can be factored, we're gonna have to use a quadratic formula. And the quadratic formula says that the values of lambda that make that zero are negative c plus or minus the square root of c squared minus four times m, the mass, times the spring constant k, all over two, uh, all over two m. <laughs> yeah, that's right, I almost forgot. All over two m, okay? So there it is. So, um, before we go further with this, let's think about what we would expect the motion of this, of this system to do, the motion of this mass to do. And one of the most important ways of, of seeing how, to, of, of kind of thinking through the motion of something is to, uh, or anything mathematical, is to take extreme situations. So let's first of all take one extreme situation where, um, where uh, C is very large and M and K are very small, okay? Now, first of all, let's see once what happens down here, if that's the case. If, if C squared is greater than 4MK, then notice that this is going to be a positive number here. Agreed? And so the square root of a positive number is a real number. Notice that if you, if you didn't have any m or k at all, this would be just c, which is the same size as this. And so the fact that you're subtracting this from this means that this quantity in here, by the time you take the square root of it, it's going to be smaller in size than this c, because if you didn't have that at all, the value of it would be c. But once you subtract something, this is going to be is going to be smaller. So the point is, the point is, what are the, what are the kinds of things you're going to get? You're going to get negative c, and then you're adding or subtracting something else to it, which is um, which is smaller than this in size. So it's always going to end up being a negative number. Because even if you add something to it, whatever you're adding is not as big in size as the C is, okay? So by the time you get your, your final answer, it's going to be, this is the homogeneous now, uh, it's going to be what? X of T is equal to alpha E to the, uh, let, let's call these lambda 1 and lambda 2. 
And uh, so lambda 1 is where you have the little plus, and lambda 2 is where you have the little minus. And so it's going to be um, uh, e to the uh, lambda 1, t plus beta, e to, to lambda 2t. Okay? So both lambda 1 and lambda 2 are going to be, are going to be negative numbers. See that? They're both going to be negative numbers, and they're going to be real numbers. So there are real negative numbers there. And so what's the, what's the, uh, what's the graph of this, of this function going to look like? If you take, let's just take an example, e to the, say, negative 3t, uh, put a constant in front of there, uh, plus or minus, whatever, 3e to the negative 2t. What, what's that going to look like? Maybe some of these are plus and some of them are negative. Who knows? Okay, but the point is, what's that going to look like? You, you, know, you know what e to the negative 3t looks like, hopefully. That's going to be a function that just kind of goes like this. If you have another one like that, it's going to have the same general shape. You start subtracting one from the other, and uh, various things can happen. Uh, and that's what I want you to kind of find out. But roughly, if you just look at what kinds of shapes those are going to be, you're going to get shapes that might look like this, or you might get a shape that looks like this, or you might get a shape that looks like this. Those are going to be your general, your general shapes that you get when you have those functions and these constants. And now let's go back and see if that makes sense physically. Let's, let's think about this. You've got a situation where the... Um, friction is very large, okay? The friction is very large, and you can think of the mass and the, uh, the, the, the stiffness of the spring as being very small, okay? So, so think of a situation where you have a very light mass and you have a very weak little spring, just a little tinny spring, okay? Just no, nothing much to it, okay? Just a little bit of pull. And you've got this heavy, viscous goo in here, okay? So you take your mass, and you pull it out, and you give it a shove this way, but, but goodness, the, there's not much inertia there, and, and, and this goo is so thick that it's not going to go very far, and now it's going to stop. And then just very, very slowly, this very weak spring is going to just slowly pull this mass, this light mass, through this goo, and it's just going to kind of finally settle down to the, to the equilibrium position. Isn't that what you'd kind of expect it, expect it to do? And, and uh, that's what I want you to see. That's what will happen. That's what the mathematics says will happen. Um, if you give it a push outwards, it's going to kind of go up, start by going farther out, but then it's going to come in like this. If you give it a, a strong enough push inwards, depending on, again, on how, how big of a mass you have here, but if you give it a, strong, a, a really heavy push inwards, give it enough of velocity, it could actually go through this equilibrium point. You're kind of giving it a, a real heavy push, so it goes through... But now after it stops, now it's just going to slowly, slowly come back. So that's this sort of situation. You gave it a really strong push. You gave it so much velocity that it pushes it all the way through. But then it's going to slowly, now it stops right here and then it slowly comes back. So those are the kinds of, those are the kinds of solutions that you would expect if, in fact, um, the, 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 notice that this is the key right here. If, if 4 times n times k is less than c squared, that's the, that's the magic cutoff point, okay? Then you're going to get things that look like this, and you're going to get this kind, of a, this kind of a graph. On the other hand, if c squared is less than 4mc, again, let's take this, consider kind of an extreme situation. Now suppose that you have yourself a really heavy mass, you've got yourself a big stiff spring, like the spring from a car or something like that, so this is a big heavy mass and the spring is pulling it back and forth like this, 
and say you've got just a little bit of friction there. I mean, this friction is, uh, th this stuff laughs at it, right? It, it doesn't even really care that it's there. If you didn't have any friction, we know it's just gonna oscillate back and forth forever. It's just gonna keep oscillating back and forth. It'll never lose any energy and it's just gonna keep going back and forth. As soon as you have some friction, now that friction is gonna take some of the, of the energy and it's gonna very slowly, slowly, slowly uh, um, bring it so that it, it, it no longer goes forever, but it'll, it'll keep oscillating, 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 and finally get down to that equilibrium position. So that's what you'd expect again. That's what I hope you'd expect when you think about it. Again, depending on what kind of a, if you give it a push out, it's going to start like this. And then something like this, where, the, where it's just going to become less and less uh, high as you go. And notice that that's exactly what we get here too. Because notice if, if C squared is less than 4MK, then this is a negative number in here. And if you have a negative number, then this is an imaginary number right here. And once you have the imaginary number, you know what happens. That's where you get your sine and your cosine, right? And you'll, you'll, we're gonna call that uh, omega, omega one t. You'll, you can go through those details, cosine, and but you can add the sines and cosines together, and basically you get some sort of a, some sort of a graph like that. It's basically gonna be something. Oops, I'm sorry. It's gonna be not quite like that because you still have. You're still going to have this part out front. You're, you're going to get, you're going to get a e to the negative c over 2m t, and then you're going to get your sine of of this inside part, which I'm just going to call omega one t. Okay. So so look what happens. You've got your sine graph. Your sine graph just keeps going up and down between one and negative one, but now you've got this thing as the envelope and e to a negative power is gonna be a, a, a function kind of like this. See, it gets negative, it looks like this. And so that forms the envelope and this is just gonna keep oscillating. It'll keep oscillating forever, but those oscillations are gonna get smaller and smaller. Okay? So, um, so uh, that's what happens. So, so I, I, I've got, got a bunch of problems for you to do or several problems for you to do where you verify this and I want you to kind of uh, um, experiment by putting in different initial conditions and see once what happens if you can get this thing to go down or, or if uh, for, for, for this one here get it to get it to go down and come back up uh, this one how, how big are the oscillations things like that so we've got some various problems but never lose sight of what you're what you're doing here the last case we have is what happens if you're right on the cusp. If you're right, right on the on the point here where you have c squared equals 4mk. Okay, what does that do? Well, if it's equal to 4mk, then this is just zero here, and so you're not adding or subtracting anything. So then notice that lambda one and lambda two are the same. And if lambda one and lambda two are the same, that's where you have a double root. So that's your case three here. And again, we're going to go, you go through the details in the book, but that's where you get a double root. And as, long, as soon as you get a double root, then you're going to get something uh, a e to the um, negative c over 2m t, and then plus b t e to the negative c over 2m t, right? You get, if you have a double root, that's where you get that t in there. What, what does a graph like this look like? Okay, and again, I just want you to, to play with that and see once what happens if you uh, use Desmos to um, to play with that but I think you'll find that that uh, this one actually acts very much like like this one uh, you can get it to you can get it to uh, go down and come back up uh, or, or you can go something like this but it basically basically acts very much like like this so those are all the things that happen and, and I want you to just be thinking about that as as you uh, look at the case where there's no force on it, where you basically just take it and give it an initial velocity and then you let it go and you watch it, okay? So that's the mass spring friction system. Now, what happens when you force it as well? So now we're gonna take this thing and we are going to 
have have some something which which um, which um, uh, puts a puts a, a, a force on this thing so you can kind of think of it as like a um, like you've got another spring here and you're you're pulling it you're pulling it and pushing it um, and you're, you're pulling it and pushing it however you're doing it you're doing something to this mass and we're gonna we're gonna force it like this we're gonna force it with a force of magnitude F and it's gonna be a cosine of uh, Omega Omega T so the the period of the force is, is omega and it's just be going good the, the force is going to be going back and forth so it's kind of like let's see I guess I've got company coming so I will uh, get back to you later okay I took advantage of uh, the little break to put some other things on the board here so I wouldn't have to write so let me uh, let me kind of uh, refresh where we are again so we've got this uh, mass which is connected to a wall by by a spring with constant k k constant and then it also has uh, friction and now we're going and and the the natural vibration of this thing is given by um, is given by uh, by this right here here's your here's your homogeneous solution so this is what you get if there's no no forcing function if this is equal to zero then this is the uh, way the thing vibrates so notice that there's a natural frequency for it that natural frequency we call it omega naught that natural frequency depends on the uh, spring constant and it also depends on the mass again if you just think about it if you've got a certain spring and you have a mass here here's the mass if this mass is really heavy what's going to happen that spring is wanting to pull it and push it and so on if the spring has lots of inertia then it's going to kind of go slow like this. You've got this big heavy duty spring, but you've got this really heavy mass and it's kind of go back and forth slow like that. So notice that when the mass is large, the frequency is, is, is smaller, is, is less, right? It, it, it vibrates fewer times per second um, or per, per time unit. On the other hand, if this mass is very small, or if K is very large, if you got a really stiff spring here, a really stiff spring, then it's going to want to go push, pull, push, pull, push, pull on this little mass. And so as the K constant is greater, or if the mass is smaller, then the frequency is going to increase. So again, everything that we see here, you should be imagining to yourself what 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 would this thing actually act like and and so the mathematics verifies hopefully verifies your intuition okay so that's why this this it's called the natural frequency it's a frequency with which it it wants to vibrate if you don't have any forcing function on it so now what are, what are we doing now we're going to include one more thing to this we're going to include a forcing function and it's kind of hard to know how to even draw this on here but you can think of it as being maybe like you've got a, a rubber band that's attached to this mass and you're gonna pull this way and then pull this way with the rubber band so that the force due to this rubber band is gonna be a positive one and it's gonna be a negative one and it's gonna be a positive one and it's gonna be a negative one and so this mass is wanting to move at a certain frequency but now you've, you've got this thing, maybe, maybe the mass wants to move like this slow, like this, back and forth and back and forth at that frequency. But now you've got this rubber band attached and this rubber band is just pulling it like, like this, back and forth and back and forth. Now it, it's not gonna just necessarily follow that rubber band, the rubber band can stretch, so it's putting a force on it, but, but the mass is, it still can still move in the opposite direction of the force if, if it's got a lot of inertia that way. So the spring is pulling it and doing different things, but now you've got this rubber band uh, that's going back and forth and back and forth uh, at its own frequency, okay? So how does all that play, okay? How does all that play together? So, um, so this is getting to be something very close to like real world situations where you have something that wants to vibrate at a certain rate and then you you put an engine on it or something which vibrates at a, a different rate 
and you get all sorts of interactions between those two. So first of all, the particular solution, if this is your forcing function, that's the non-homogeneous part, then the particular solution is going to look something like this, right? It's going to be, we, we already did one like this, it's going to be something times cosine of omega t plus something of sine of omega t. And you have to find out what a and b are, and all this stuff I, I leave for you. It's, uh, I've got the kind of the, some of the steps in the book, and I'm asking you to fill in the details. A lot of solid algebra there uh, in order to do those exercises, okay? So, um, so you get that, and uh, once you have that, then again, I'm not writing down all the in-between steps that are even in the book, but then we're going to assume that our, we're starting at, at the initial position of zero, at the, at the equilibrium position, and we're also going to assume, just to make it easy, that our initial velocity is zero. So we're starting right here, and now that we're starting right here, now we're going to start acting on it with this force function that's going to start pulling it back and forth, and that's going to get the thing moving. So by the time all that happens, the general solution of this thing is going to look like this. And again, I'm skipping lots of steps here, which are in the book, but it looks like this, and I'm using a bunch of trig that I also talk about in the book, and you're going to have the sine of this times the sine of this, and basically... This is going to be a sine wave which has a very small uh, number, like sine of one tenth t. That's going to have a large wavelength like this, and then this is going to have a small wavelength. It's going to have a high frequency and a small wavelength. So you got one wrapped up into another. So this thing is going to be going, going like this. So this mass. Can you imagine what this mass is going to do? It's going to go like this farther out and then it's going to start kind of going like this and it's going to start going like this again and then it's going to start going like this and it's just going to going to have have all these small oscillations that are that are going to keep getting bigger and bigger and then they're going to get smaller and smaller and then they're going to get bigger and bigger and that that's the interplay that's the interplay between this force which wants it to go in a certain way, and then the natural frequency, which wants it to go in a certain way. Okay, so um, so um, I mentioned in the in the uh, book that that these things are really really important. The, 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 these form beats of an of a guitar, and you can tune your guitar with them. And uh, there's other things as well that these are important. Finally, what happens then if these two are going at the same frequency? So in other words, the force with which you are, are pushing it, you, it, this thing wants to move like this, and that's exactly the way you pull on it. You pull on it exactly the way it wants to move. When it's moving this direction, you're pulling it this direction. As it's moving that direction, you're pulling it that direction. Very much like a, you, if you're pushing a child on a swing. And so what do you do? You just keep pushing them. Each time they come to you, you give them a push. Or you might be up above there, just going back and forth with the swing, and you're just, just putting a force on that swing that's going back and forth just exactly as the swing wants to go back and forth. So you're going at the same frequency. Then what happens? Notice what happens then. Then, just like a swing, if you have a swing and you just keep pushing it uh, more and more and, and if there's no friction that's what we're assuming here there's no friction that swing is going to just keep going higher and higher and eventually it's going to top go on all the way over and that's essentially what happens here notice that you're going to get t times the sine of t so you get yourself uh, uh, an envelope which is in the shape of a line and you put this the sine curve inside that and it's just going to get larger and larger amplifications and this is, again, super important. This is, a, check out, Tacoma Bridge. That's a famous bridge that they built in Washington, and they didn't take this into account. Uh, I don't know if they didn't know about it at that point, or they just forgot to do it. But the wind coming down the, the, the wind coming down the, uh, the, the kind of the, the cavern um, the, of, uh, that, that the bridge was built over, was in sync with the natural vibration of the bridge. The bridge wanted to vibrate like this, and the wind gusts were at the same same frequency. 
And so that, that bridge just kept going farther and farther and farther. And you can see it happened in 1950s, I think. I can't remember for sure. And that bridge just starts buckling and the whole bridge just falls apart. And luckily they have a bunch of cameras that, that see it all falling apart. And even though they lost the bridge, it's, it's a great, great object lesson for engineers just to remind them you need to take this into account. So, uh, so that's the Tacoma Bridge. So all this stuff is really interesting. It's just connected to the real world. So neat. Uh, finally, in the last part of the section, I say what happens if C is not equal to zero? And basically, it's essentially the same. It, it's the same sorts of behavior. It just modifies things a little bit, but it's essentially going to be the same sort of behavior, especially if C is a very small number. Okay, if C is a small number, it's going to be... Um, it's going to essentially have the same sort of behavior. So uh, with the Tacoma Bridge, there was a little bit of friction there, but there wasn't enough friction to overcome the, the pushing of the, from the wind. Okay. Oh, by the way, that's why they have uh, soldiers, I'm told, when they cross a bridge, they no longer walk in step. They no longer you know, go left, right, left, right. They break, they break their cadence. Because again, they don't want a vibration on that bridge that might possibly be in sync with the natural vibration of the bridge. If it could, you could possibly have a bridge that falls apart just from people, you know, thousands of, of soldiers uh, stomping on it. Okay, so all sorts of things like this. Another example I mentioned in the book is if I get into a nice little cell, a stall of a bathroom with the steel walls uh, on both sides of me, then um, then if I hum like that, at a certain frequency, it, it's going to sound like this. At a certain frequency, it's very loud. And that's because at that one frequency, all those sound waves are just, the, the natural frequency is matched to the, to, the, to the driving force. The driving force is my throat, and I keep adding to the to the uh, to the sound wave every time it comes by I'm adding to it and I'm just making it go louder and louder and louder and that's how instruments work they they, they have their, their the, the, the the length of the instrument is designed to be right in step with the frequency with which you are blowing so that the the the, the uh, column of air uh, get keeps increasing 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 in intensity as you keep blowing that same amount into it over uh, continually it just adds up and that's why when you play a trombone for example as you play different notes you need to change the the length of the of the uh, tubing in order to have that natural frequency match up so this is this is a real rough quick explanation but it all just shows the importance of this stuff in all sorts of things in life in sound and and uh, mechanical systems electrical systems as I mentioned it all it all kind of works the same so, very good. That should do it.